we'd done La Boheme, I think straight after, after Moulin Rouge. And we were living in New York. And so I watched the Rick Burns documentary called New York. It was a revelation to me. And I recommend anyone who ever goes to New York to watch that whole series. Because what you learn is that New York was created. It was created as a grid. And it really is, it really is the world's capital. People come from all over the world to form this extraordinary city, and it's on a little island, and it builds and it grows, and, and no one narrates the spirit and the essence and kind of the inner, inner life of New York better than F. Scott Fitzgerald. There are so many things that, um, that my golden mirage, if I try and quote him, I'll get them all, all the quotes wrong, but I extemporize by saying that, that he was able to put into words what the essence of New York is. And, and he speaks about New York like a lover. And he has fallen so... In, he's, in, he's in an intoxicating... He's intoxicated by New York, you know, in, in a mad, wild love relationship. And yet somehow that lover destroys him. And it's sort of a parallel with Fitzgerald's own relationship with Zelda. So it's really expressed beautifully in the... In the in the documentary by Mr. Burns. And I suggest that, that anyone who watches Gatsby have a look at that documentary, because you'll see the correlation. Everything is possible, a 23-year-old Midwesterner named F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote to his fiancee Zelda the day he arrived in February. I am in the land of ambition and success. It's really interesting with Fitzgerald because, you know, as a young man, as a young person, he was not a success. For months after his arrival, F. Scott Fitzgerald had tried to make a go of it as a writer, working at an advertising agency by day and pouring out stories by night that were rejected as swiftly as he could write them. Now he's trying to write and he's not very successful and he keeps sending his works to this guy called Max Perkins, who's a young publisher with a publishing house in New York and they're always getting rejected. Anyway, he's given it up. Then in June, when his fiancée, Zelda, temporarily broke off their engagement. He went on a three-week drinking binge, sobered up, and rapidly rewrote the manuscript of an already rejected novel. F. Scott Fitzgerald gets drunk, goes on a bender, gets out all the best work he's ever done, cuts it into pieces, and strings a plot together. Published in the spring of 1920, under the title This Side of Paradise, the book unfurled like a banner over the entire age, one man said capturing as nothing else had, the reckless spirit of a whole generation, disillusioned with the past, and determined to throw itself headlong into the future, come what may. And F. Scott Fitzgerald says, I wake up famous. And he and Zelda comes back, they get married, they move into the plaza, and for 10 years, they were the first ever equivalent of youth quake rock stars. They were these two young people who had created the jazz age phenomena of phrase Fitzgerald coined, the jazz age, and their feet did not touch the ground. Fitzgerald's meteoric career was launched as the city itself began its giddy upward climb. In the years to come, no one would chronicle the arc of its dark and shining trajectory more poignantly than he. The whole golden boom was in the air its splendid generosities, its outrageous corruptions, and the torturous death struggle of the old America. There seemed little doubt about what was going to happen. America was going on the greatest, gaudiest spree in history. And there was going to be plenty to tell about it. Have Scott Fitzgerald. is for many people seems to be the moment when New York becomes very familiar. I think that the phrase the Roaring Twenties can best be understood perhaps with reference to the explosion of image making. The new mass media of motion pictures, the new mass media of radio broadcasting. What's roaring about the Twenties, in other words, is the tremendous amplification, intensification of 
image making, image selling, especially through new means of mass media. One of the things that's burbling up in the streets is jazz. I mean, what's not to like? It is the spectacular efflorescence. I mean, jazz is not a New York phenomenon. But in the 20s, black musicians come pouring into Harlem. By 1927, the tempo of the city had changed sharply. The uncertainties of 1920 were drowned in a steady golden roar. And many of our friends had grown wealthy. But the restlessness of New York in 1927 approached hysteria. The parties were bigger. The shows were broader. The buildings were higher. The morals were looser. And the liquor was cheaper. But all these benefits did not really minister to much delight. Young people wore out early. They were hard and languid at 21. And none of them contributed anything new. Most of my friends drank too much. The more they were in tune with the times, the more they drank. F. Scott Fitzgerald. By 1927, the decade was beginning to take its toll on Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald. Two years before, his greatest novel, The Great Gatsby, published to critical acclaim, but in different sales, had captured as nothing else had the romance, wonder, and heartbreaking tragedy of the metropolis he would soon call My Lost City. But Zelda, always unstable, had begun to slide into mental illness and Fitzgerald himself, woefully alcoholic, was becoming increasingly self-destructive. Perhaps he had flown too high in the first wild rush of success to ever fly so high again. Perhaps it was true, as Fitzgerald himself declared, that there were no second acts in American lives. And yet, if the city of ambition and success was destroying him, a few things still seemed possible. Asked by a reporter what his ultimate ambition was, Fitzgerald said simply, to stay in love with Zelda and write the greatest novel in the world. Well, he was such a romanticist, and he was on the side of believing that everything wonderful was possible. He said in one of his writings, all my girls were so young and full of promise, and, and who would want something better than that? And then in The Great Gatsby, when he says, uh, in his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whisperings and the champagne and the stars. Oh, well, that was what America there. It was a tiny little bit of America, but we all believed it. And none of us got to Long Island, none of us got to Gatsby's place, but that was something to think about. And then, as a romance, Gatsby had to die. In the spring of 27, something bright and alien flashed across the sky. A young Minnesotan who seemed to have nothing to do with his generation did a heroic thing. And for a moment, people set down their glasses in country clubs and speakeasies and thought of their old best dreams. Maybe there was a way out by flying. Maybe our restless blood could find frontiers in the illimitable air. But by that time, we were all pretty much committed. And the jazz age continued. We would all have one more. F. Scott Fitzgerald. All through the summer of 1929, there had been ominous rumblings. For months, unemployment had been rising. Automobile sales and department store revenues had fallen off sharply. Across the South and West, farms were failing in record numbers. And still on Wall Street, 
the delirious optimism continued, undimmed. What caused the crash of 29 was excess speculation. What had happened was that the American economy as a whole had begun to cool in starting in 1928. And the Wall Street economy disconnected from the underlying real economy and became a speculative bubble. And this fueled the speculation that just took off and took off and took off until, again, one day, somebody woke up and said, this has gone too far. As summer turned to fall, the mood changed. As the stock market dipped, then rose, then lurched downwards again, investors grew increasingly uneasy. And then the bottom fell out. In less than two hours, nearly $10 billion invested in stocks was simply wiped out. Outside on the street, crowds massed six deep in front of the stock exchange, while hundreds more stood in shocked silence on the steps of Federal Hall. The following Tuesday, October 29, 1929, known forever after as Black Tuesday, another tidal wave of selling hit the exchange. Just people wanted out. And this was in the fall. Most crashes tend to be in the fall. And I think, again, it's human psychology. You tend to be more cautious in the fall. I mean, the, the speculations of summer that seem so brilliant, and suddenly when the chill winds of October come, you wonder if they're such a good idea and you try to get out. And if too many people do that at once, that it, it causes the market to drop, which causes more people to want to get out, and suddenly, you know, the snowball uh, rolls down the hill. Scott Fitzgerald was somewhere in North Africa when the end came and thought he heard a dull, distant crash echoing to the farthest wastes of the desert. Zelda's condition was worsening. When he finally returned to what he called my lost city, he knew instantly that everything had changed. I can only cry out that I have lost my splendid mirage. Come back, come back, oh glittering and white. F. Scott Fitzgerald. No one sensed those changes more poignantly or expressed them more lyrically than the city's brilliant fallen angel, F. Scott Fitzgerald, whose own career was already descending into darkness. Two years after the crash, in what he called the dark autumn of 1931, he returned to New York for the first time in nearly three years. A lifetime before, he had come to a place where everything seemed possible. Now, everything had changed. And in a piercing, clear-eyed, melancholy essay called My Lost City, he struggled to put into words exactly what that was. From the ruins, lonely and inexplicable as the Sphinx, rose the Empire State Building. And just as it had been a tradition of mine to climb to the plaza roof to take leave of the beautiful city, extending as far as the eyes could reach, so now I went to the roof of the last and most magnificent of towers. Then I understood. Everything was explained. I had discovered the crowning error of the city, its Pandora's box. Full of vaunting pride, the New Yorker had climbed here and seen with dismay what he had never suspected. That the city was not the endless succession of canyons that he had supposed but that it had limits, fading out into the country on all sides, into an expanse of green and blue that alone was limitless. And with the awful realization that New York was a city after all, and not a universe, the whole shining edifice that he had reared in his imagination came crashing to the ground. That was the gift of Alfred Smith to the citizens of New York.
f. scott fitzgerald.